Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Aisha Doggett, and I'm one of the elders here at LifePoint. And as I'm sharing these announcements with you this morning, you can take the liberty of introducing yourself to the person next to you, or just saying good morning again and saying how much you love the person sitting next to you and how grateful you are to have them be with you today on this beautiful uh, Saturday, Sabbath day. Okay, so our announcements are on flock note, but it's great to have reminders because when you repeat things over and over again, you remember them more and more. So our first one I wanna share with you is that today is the last day of our series at the movies. Some of you have on your name tags and have written down your favorite movies. Today our movie is Interstellar. Um, so you're in for a treat today. Um, understanding more of God's love and how that works together with um, just the goodness of Him. Our other announcement is that we do have a few more tickets um, for our baseball game um, that is tomorrow. And so I believe you can go out to, into the hallway and at the front desk. And if you still want, um, I think there's like five more left. So there might not be very many if you still want to um, join us at the baseball game. Go and see how many more tickets we have left. Um, and then our other announcement is that we're starting a new sermon series next week. And this sermon series is called Troubled Hearts. Um, and so, you know, a lot of us need to feel God's peace and just feel settled in these troubled times, really. Um, and so Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and caring, you know, caring heaven burdens. So Jesus wants to be that lifter for us. He wants to carry our burdens when we just feel low. So um, come join us next week to see what it's all about. And an exciting um, announcement that I had the privilege of sharing um, as being the women's ministry leader. Next week, August 5th, Right after church, I'm calling all women. So if you're a woman, no matter how, what age you are, raise your hand. Hi, I'm gonna wave at you. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, so after church, you're gonna come and you're gonna hang out with me and the other women's ministry leaders and have some ice cream and popsicles and say hello and, and nice to meet you and here are some cool, exciting things that are coming your way, like discipleship, all the fun things. So we're really excited about that and meeting all of you. I can't wait to just love you and just say hello and all the good things. Enjoy your day today. May God just fill your hearts and you feel his love today. All right, guys? Happy Sabbath. Good morning, Life Point. I want to welcome you again, those of you who are here worshiping with us. Or if you're joining us online, are you guys ready to begin singing and lifting our voices, just praising him this morning? Before we start, I want to share a verse with you guys this morning from Ephesians 1.18. And it says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with the light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly, where did I, it was in the heavenly Realms, thank you. All right, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to lift him in song this morning as we praise him. Let's put our hands together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord.
a longing that reaches past the stars. There's an answer to every question mark. There's a name. There's a hope flowing through these veins. There's a voice that echoes through the pain. There's a
Love, cer Love certainly does have a name and his name is Jesus. I'm so honored to be here before you today and just leading you closer and closer to, to the heart of God and to understanding his love for you and that God is love. So our text today is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And so we're going to med meditate on this text together. And it says, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so um, before preparing today, just, you know, I'm thinking about like, what am I going to share before prayer and talking with Pastor Ruben? He said, you know, share a story. And so I was talking to my husband, like, well, what story do I share about love? Like, you know, there's so many stories about Jesus and loving those around him and, and um, giving to those and his sacrifice. And um, he's like, well, just share about you being a wife and a mom. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, that's true. I could just share that. And so, you know, as a wife and as a mom, sometimes I just feel like I, I try to love, but then I'm like, God, am I loving the right way? Am I loving my daughter enough? Am I giving her enough of my attention every day? You know, like when I put her to bed at night, do I feel like I did my best? Or does my husband feel like I gave him my all today, you know? And, and it's easy to get down on yourself um, as just a human being, not just as a woman, because yes, that's what I, I can relate to, but as, you know, as a human being to feel like, am I living up to the love of God and what he's called me to, you know, to be? And, and so, um, there's a famous theologian, his name is Charles Spurgeon, and he quoted, um, he said, nearness to God brings likeness to God. And I was like, oh, how I love to be in God's presence. And I just love to just spend time with him and to meditate on his word. And so God clearly spoke to me like, Aisha, like I am love. So you spend more time with me. You're gonna look more and more like me and, and demonstrating this love that I've called you to share with your husband and, and with your daughter. And, and so um, the verse, 1 John 4, 16 through 18, it says, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and God lives in him, in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. So I challenge you today just to say, you know, Satan, like get thee behind me. You know, I am drawn closer and nearer to the heart of God. And he demonstrates his perfect love by dying for me and giving his all for me. And if I spend more and more time with him, I'm going to look more and more like him. And that confidence will build in you as you look more and more like Jesus. And so that's our prayer today, church. I'm gonna kneel, but you can pray however you'd like to today. And I just challenge you just to draw near and near to him as we come before him and just remembering his perfect love, remembering his sacrifice on the cross and just thinking about all those areas of your life that you really want to show love, but you're like, God, I'm not sure if I'm actually showing love. Do I have pride in my heart? Am I showing enough humility to those around me? Am I living for your kingdom? Am I sacrificing enough? Am I putting others before myself? Take those questions and bring them before the foot of the Father today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are a great, awesome, wonderful God who has loved us first. You created us, Lord, in your image, God, and we are so thankful 
for the opportunity that we have to call you our Father. We thank you for Jesus, your Son, who died for us so that we can live forever. We have this beautiful gift to live forever and just to show your love, Jesus, to those who are closest to us, to our spouses and to our children and to our parents and just to those in our community, God, so that they can see you and so that they can see the heart of you, Lord, and draw near to you, Lord. God, I pray for those who just feel broken and that right now it just feels hard to love, God. I pray that you just soften their hearts, Lord, and just soften them and help them just to know, Lord, that you are a God of love and you've always been there, even when it didn't feel like it, Lord. You've always been there writing their story, God. I pray, God, that today we anticipate your faithfulness. We anticipate just you speaking to us and knowing that you're going to do what you've said you're going to do. Your promises, Lord, are there. So we're just going to cling on to those promises, Lord, and hold on to them and not let the the lies of Satan destroy our minds, Lord. We thank you for you and your gift. And Lord, we just thank you for the words that you will speak to our hearts today. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, welcome everyone today and say happy Sabbath to you. Okay. Also, I want to welcome those watching online. I want to thank Aisha and the worship team for setting us up this morning. Um, before we jump into the message today, I'm a little bit uh, sentimental because it's the last weekend of our kids' month. And so I want to take, just take a moment uh, to show some gratitude to everyone that's made this month possible. And so I know we thanked a lot of you. Uh, last week, but I want to continue thinking if that's okay. Can you give me permission to do that? Yeah. So can we thank our, our VBS leaders once again, all volunteers um, doing VBS? Yeah. And a special uh, thank you to uh, Shanti and Marcus and Kristen who've helped us set up the extra activities throughout the month. Can we give them a hand as well? And um, we've invested a lot in kids this month because we value the next generation and we want to create spaces for them, including worship um, that are for them. And so uh, this morning, I just want to show some gratitude to everyone that works with children. So if you work in Sabbath school or you worked in a school, uh, our school or any other school, can you just please stand up for a second? If you're a teacher either in Sabbath school or school, can you just stand up for a second? Don't be shy. Yeah, can we give everyone a hand, please? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for investing and spending time with children. And for those of you that do it for a profession, may God be with you in this new school year. We will dedicate our staff uh, next month just for asking for God's blessing uh, throughout the school year. So today is our last, our last week, and we've been looking at movies because movies tell us stories sometimes that that life uh, we don't see in life or we don't feel. And sometimes we'll walk out of a movie feeling energized and pumped up. Sometimes we learn things and other times, um, it happened, happened to me several times where I'm five minutes into a movie and I'll shut it off because I just, I wasn't feeling it, right? It wasn't a good movie. But movies and stories have a way of inspiring us and moving us. And, and Jesus knew this and the Bible knows this, God knows this. And so everything in the Bible is written in story format from Genesis to the book of Revelation. It's all one big story of how God wants to connect with humanity, how God wants to connect with you. 
And so there's powers in stories. The stories we tell and how we tell them make a massive, massive difference. And so Hollywood is no different. We can disagree highly with Hollywood. We can have different values. We can have different ways of life. Um, but still, there's movies that connect us closer to God in spite of all of that. And so that's what we've been doing this month, and I hope you've been enjoying it. And if, you haven't, if you've been enduring it, you're just one message away from, from taking a break for one whole year. Um, so today we're, we're looking at an interesting story I'll introduce later on. And before we get into that story, I'm going to get into a different story from the Bible. It's a story of a, of a, of a man who kind of had it all together. He, he had a good life. He had a good family. He had a good education. He had a master's and doctorate's degree in the Bible. So he was pretty important. He not only had a good job, but he was also in selected in, in kind of uh, special clubs and councils and committees. He was a respected person people looked up to and went for advice, uh, not only within his circles, but throughout the community. And we learn about this individual because he came to Jesus one day, right? If he hadn't come to Jesus, we would have never heard about him. He would have been important for his time and then no other time, and that would have been it. But one day he approached Jesus, and because he approached Jesus, then we get to learn about him today. And his life was good, but there was something that was missing. His, his life had, he had everything he needed, but still he had a void inside. And it's almost like he was going in the right direction, but it didn't feel like it. I don't know if you've ever been going the right direction, but it didn't feel like it. And, and somebody maybe in the car kept telling you, it feels like we're not going in the right, same dire right direction, but you're like, the GPS is telling me we're going in the right direction. Like there was these tourists in, in Canada, I think it was last week, and their GPS was telling them to go in a direction, and it didn't seem right, it didn't feel right, but because the GPS was telling them to go a certain direction, they obeyed the GPS. Now, I wish I would have brought the video, you can find it later, but they ended up driving into a lake. <laughs> right direction, but it didn't feel right because the obvious stated that cars don't go on water or in water. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like we're going through life, but it doesn't feel right. We, are, we think we're doing the right things. We may be going to church, watching online. We may be reading the Bible. We may be praying. We may be doing the right thing at work. We may be kind and courteous. We may be obedient. We may be trying to find what's true and what's not true in the world. But something inside is off. And we'll try to do more and be better and be more uh, kinder and, and, and more merciful and more compassionate. But the more we try, the more we have this type of void inside and it's almost like someone needs to come and hit that reset button for us now something we know well to do is that we know how to reset our phones for example if my phone's acting up I know how to reset an, I an iPhone very well I just press two buttons hold it for a little bit and then it'll give me the option I just slide and then it'll reset now if you have an Android phone I can't help you you got to go to a different church for that one um, but I know how to reset it, right? I know how to reset it. My computer, if it acts up, I know how to reset it. And if I have to do a deep reset, which means I have to bring it back to factory settings, I know how to do that too. As a matter of fact, we know more about our phones and how to protect our phones than about our hearts and how to protect our hearts. I can reset a phone, but how do I reset a heart? I know how to go to in a certain direction. I know what stuff I should be reading, but how do I understand it? And so we'll go through life needing a reset of our hearts and needing a reset of our lives because we're maybe going the right direction, but it doesn't feel like it. And we need something to start over and to make sense and to be real. And that's what this man was feeling. This guy's name was Nicodemus. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3. He was not just Nicodemus, but he was a Pharisee, and he was a member of the Jew Jewish ruling council. In other words, he was in the most important committee, the most important team in the entire city, town, and nation. He had everything he needed, but something felt off. He had all the right information. He had all the right groups of people around him. It, 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 it was like he had the right structure, the right belief, the right church, the right God, the right day of rest. But something was missing. You see, he wasn't missing more information and he wasn't missing more structure. He wasn't missing more worship. He was missing something else. And so he came to Jesus when? 
at night. A little bit sneaky, right? He doesn't want anybody to see him. He's an important person, but he wants to come to Jesus. And it's interesting that he calls him rabbi. He calls him teacher, although he's a teacher. He's probably like the, one of the highest teachers, but he recognizes that Jesus knows something that he doesn't know. And he says, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God weren't with you. Look, Jesus, there's, there's something that you have that I don't have. There's apparently that something that you're doing that I want to do. Jesus, I want to understand God the way you understand him. Can you help me hit the reset button? And look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, I tell you truly, or very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, he kind of didn't, Nicodemus didn't ask a question, but Jesus answered it anyways, right? God will do that sometimes to us when we're not asking a certain question, but because God knows your heart, he knows exactly what you need before you ask it. And sometimes the things that come from God make no sense because we're not asking that question, but God knows we need that answer. And so he says, I know you want to see God and he uses an interesting phrase here to see. I know you want to see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. But in order to see the kingdom of God, you need to be born again. In other words, in 2023 language, this is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. He said, you know, in your office, you know, that wall you have with all your titles the one that has your awards laid out on the desk, the one that kind of shows your life work and accomplishments and how good of a person you are, that whole wall doesn't count for anything. You know how many times you've taught to adults and families and children, all those lessons and all those teachings doesn't count for anything. You know all those times you've gone to church and you've worshiped and you poured out your heart, well, it doesn't count for anything. You know all those times you went out of your way and you were a kind person and you gave more than you had? It doesn't count for anything. It's amazing that Jesus is breaking down his life. He's kind of helping him reset, but before he resets, he's kind of refragmenting. He's breaking into pieces his life to show him that although he had all these building blocks to build up his life, to build up his resume, to build up his image, it did not count for anything when it came to seeing the kingdom of God. Our good works don't count for anything when it comes to building up our, our, our ability to see the kingdom of God or understand the kingdom of God. Should we be good people and go, do good things and be good professionals? Yes. But it's foolish to believe that because I'm a good person that God will accept me because I've become a good person. And that's what he's trying to tell Nicodemus. But the flip side of that is also true. That no matter how bad I am or how many bad things I've done or thought, I can't be bad enough for God not to accept me. It's true on both sides. Jesus says, I don't need you to bring anything to see the kingdom of God, and it doesn't matter how many bad things you've done. You know, in order to see the kingdom of God, in order to hit that reset button, you need to be reborn. You need to be reborn. And so obviously Nicodemus is like, okay, um, help me understand this here because I don't. How can I be reborn when I'm old? Surely, I, I, you know, I cannot enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born again. And so Jesus says, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Kingdom of God. This, this idea that's, that's kind of in the future, and for Jewish minds, the kingdom of God was always in the future. That God would ultimately bring his kingdom down, and they would reign with God forever. And every Jewish person was looking for this event to happen where God would bring his kingdom. It, it wasn't just the Hebrew people that thought this way, it was also the Greeks that thought this way. The Greeks believed that life was cyclical, that every so often life would kind of reset, the world would reset and start all over. 
And every reset was a new opportunity to start life fresh. Maybe not for you, but maybe for the next generation or the following generation. And so that same idea that Greeks believe and Hebrews believe is the same idea that Jesus is talking about. The, the he, Greek word for that is palinesia. Can you say that with me? Same term that Jesus uses referring to the kingdom of God. Something that's out there, something that you can't touch, something you can't measure, something that's hard to understand, but something that brings hope. But the kingdom of God would bring all death to an end, all suffering to an end, all oppression to an end, all enemies to an end. And so Hebrew people longed for that. And Greek people just had accepted that that's the way that life was. And so Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, 28, listen to what he says. He says, truly I tell you, at the renewal or perusia, of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed the will will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus there uses the same word. He's not talking about the present. He's talking about the future. A future event that will change all events, that will change the history of this world and the history of the universe. And it's not just talking about something in the future that Jesus refers to his second coming, but Paul also talks about this in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, where he says that he's, Jesus saved us through the washing of rebirth and parousia, renewal, by the Holy Spirit. In other words, what Paul and Jesus are saying is that this parousia that's in the future, the kingdom of God, is not just in the future, power in the future, but is also power in the present. What Jesus is telling Nicodemus is if you want to hit that reset button, you don't need to go read more books. You don't need to go and read the Bible all over again, although you should. You don't need to worship more, even though it's good for you. You don't need more relationships, even though you need them, right? They're important. What you need is to allow the power of the kingdom of God, which is in the future, to interact with you in the present, to be reborn, a different type of rebirth. Not the human rebirth, but a spiritual rebirth. If you gave your life to Jesus and, and, and were baptized in the past, you can remember that moment right now as a special moment. A moment that you felt spiritual, you felt connected to God, you felt that that was the thing you needed to do in order to be closer to Jesus. And everyone who's made that decision remembers that moment, remembers the moment that they kind of heard God's voice or God's leading, that moment where a light bulb turned on and you understood a scripture, you understood an idea, you understood how, what God meant to you, and, and now you're asking, what can I do for him? And so it's a natural response to God's working in your life. That feeling, that moment, that light bulb that you felt that was not birthed inside of you out of your own decision, your own desire, your own will. No, that's the parousia the kingdom of God, which is in the future, but connected with you in that moment in the present. It was a rebirth, a new start, a reset to live a new life in Jesus. Now, that moment is not an end-all, be-all moment. Like when I give my life to Jesus and I'm baptized, there's nothing magical about the water. Like someone said it earlier, it's not holy water. Right, The water doesn't do anything but the obvious, right? The same thing when you go to the pool, to the beach, or take a shower. The water cleanses, it cleans, but in my heart, it doesn't do anything. It's a symbol that, that represents something deeper, something more important, something life-changing. It means that I'm in physically going underwater like someone being placed in a tomb. I'm dying to an old self, old life, old desires, old mindset, and I'm coming out of the water, right? Because I'm not staying down there. Like if a pastor keeps you underwater, that's a problem. Unless you can hold your breath for a long time or fight him off or her off. Um, but the idea is to come out of the water because you're coming out as a new person. You're accepting that Christ has died for you and, the, and you want to be part of his kingdom that's in the future, but also in the present. And so that baptism is a symbol of something that started and is going to continue until Jesus comes. 
Your transformation, my transformation, my reset is not just a moment that I hit a button, is not just one prayer, not just one decision, but it's an ongoing process of the Holy Spirit inside of me changing me from the inside out. And so Nicodemus had the outside stuff figured out. He had the right information. He had the right faith. He had the right God. He had the right practices. He kept all 600 plus Pharise uh, Levitical laws and how to keep the 10 laws clean. He did all of that stuff. But his heart wasn't committed or submitted to God yet. He was trying to renew himself, clean himself, reset himself, save himself without God. And one of the biggest temptations for Christians is to save ourselves without God. One of the big temptations for those that work in churches like myself is to work my salvation out, literally. Like, the biggest temptation I have is to work, 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 thinking that I'm doing it for God and think that God is requiring that of me. God's not requiring me to do more than he's asking me to do. And because I do more, it does not mean that God loves me more. <laughs> It doesn't mean I'm saved more or holier than anyone else in this room. I can't work my way into heaven and I can't work my way out of heaven. There's only one thing that changes my heart and my life that causes a reset, that causes a transformation and rebirth, and that's the Holy Spirit coming into my life. I do that and I have to continue to do that day in and day out and day in and day out because it's a process. When we think that we've arrived and our process is over, we're just fooling ourselves. And we just go into our own ways of doing religion and doing faith and doing church. And we cause damage. We cause damage in our own lives, and then we start begin to cause damage in everyone else's life because now we begin to observe what people do and they don't do, and we begin to judge them because we believe we've arrived. And if I've arrived, that means that everyone should behave like me. Everyone should talk like me. Everyone should eat like me. Everyone should dress like me. Everyone should worship like me. Everyone should keep the Sabbath like me. Everyone should be faithful like me. Everyone should serve like me. Are we getting the point? Kind of, right? And the flip side of that is that we feel that because I've done one bad thing or one bad thing happened to me that my life doesn't matter or it's not good enough for God and that I could never serve. I, I could never sing or preach. I could never, you know, share my faith with others. I could never serve because if people knew what I've done in the past, then maybe they wouldn't accept me as one in the church or equal in the church. And that's also a lie. We have clear examples of how God transforms people in the Bible, and that's why we have so many stories, because it's how God works with messed up people and changes their life. God called a messed up teenager, and his name was Peter, really messed up dude, rough around the edges, really messed up, said a lot of things, talked a big game, but didn't back it up. <laughs> and Jesus walked with him and was patient with him and loved Peter and began to transform Peter's life. And when you see Peter after Jesus has come out of the, the grave, he begins to be transformed. And, and even though he messed up big time and denied Jesus three times, Jesus meets with him right after he's resurrected and says, Peter, do you love me? He doesn't ask him any deep theological questions. He doesn't ask him any particular belief or behavior. He just says, do you love me? He not only asked him once, he asked him three times. Peter's life is transformed because the Holy Spirit got hold of his heart and began to change him from the inside out. Paul was another guy whose life is transformed. There was a, there was a guy whose name used to be Saul and he used to persecute those that followed Jesus, people like Peter. Not only just persecute them and make their life impossible, he was killing them. And one day on one of his trips to go kill people that followed Jesus, Jesus showed up. And not just showed up like in the gentle, kind way, like Jesus, staff, and shepherd with sheep. No, he showed up in his glory and blinded him. <laughs> 
And Saul is thrown off his horse and he's kind of thrown off life. And this reset begins to happen in Saul's life because something was missing inside. And he realizes that he's been doing bad things for wrong reasons. And he falls in love with Jesus. And Jesus begins to change his life. And he kind of disappears for two, three years. But when he comes back, he's a different person. Now, from persecuting people that love Jesus, he's the number one fan, the number one evangelist, the number one preacher, the number one cheerleader for Jesus. Total transformation because the Holy Spirit got hold of his heart. Nothing is impossible for God. And when the Bible talks about things aren't impossible for God, what he's really talking about is saving you from yourself. It's actually found in Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus is talking about that that a rich man can't enter heaven like if a rich person's number one thing is money. If they can't let go of money, they can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jewish people believe that people that were rich were blessed by God, therefore they were rich. And so when the disciples heard that a rich person couldn't enter heaven if their number one focus was money, it was like, well, then who can enter heaven? And that's where Jesus says, for man, it may seem impossible, But for God, nothing is impossible. There's nothing impossible from God reaching your heart and transforming it. There's nothing from your past, present, and future that would scare God away. There's no idea that's too big for God to handle. There's no question that God has an answer. There's no problem that God can't solve. When I give my heart to Jesus, the impossible becomes possible. My life begins to change from the inside out. And the most beautiful thing about it is that's a crazy transformation. It's a radical transformation. It's such a big change that I can't take credit for it because I've tried my entire life to do what's happening and I haven't been able to do it. So I just give praise and honor to God. Maybe you feel a little stuck. Maybe you gave your life to Jesus some time ago, but you're feeling like Nicodemus, like, you know, I I gave my life to Jesus, but I continue to be the same person I was before. Or, or, Or maybe you've had some change in your life and certain things have been let go and certain things have been, are new and they're going the right direction, but then you got redirected. Or, or maybe you just didn't feel like you were going the right way. Or, or maybe you got discouraged or maybe you got hurt or maybe you just felt abandoned And now you're at a place of discovery or rediscovery, wanting to know what God will do next, or maybe even doubting that God can do something with you or through your life. You're not alone. Because Nicodemus felt the same way. And that's why he came to Jesus. Jesus continued and said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. It's interesting that Jesus uses this birth analogy, right? This new reset. Something I'm born into that creates two new things. When I'm reborn in Christ, I I, I gain new senses. Just like when a child comes to life, that child gains senses, like they become aware of everything around them. From colors to light to voices to people to moving objects, everything is new and all senses are heightened. And so when someone is being transformed from Jesus, there's new senses. You become aware of things that before you ignored. You begin to understand things that before you had a hard time reading. You begin to have new compassion and new kindness and new love to those that are far from God. Not only do you have new senses, but you also have a new family. Because now... God becomes your father and everyone that's a child of God becomes your brother and your sister. You're not alone. Now you belong to a bigger group of people that are wanting to serve their father, their master, their God, their savior. And so you have this new uh, mindset, this renewal of the mind with new understanding. This new sense of belonging and identity and purpose and direction. It's almost like our loves are reordered. Right? Where God takes priority and the center of our life and he begins to put everything in its place. Nicodemus had a hard time understanding this because he thought he had to do something in the process. 
But it's so interesting, once again, that Jesus uses the process of a birth or child labor. So in child labor, there, there's something beautiful that happens, that a new life is, is birthed, right? A new life comes into, into our realities. And in that process, there's one individual doing lots of work. It's usually not the father. The mother's doing how much of the work? Can't hear you all. All of it? How many agree with all? How many think partial? I wouldn't raise your hand. Yeah. Mother's doing all the work. Father can coach. The father can be alongside. The father can kind of be present, not doing any work, not experiencing any pain. Might pass out, (laughs) not helping at all. How much work does a baby do? In the process of being birthed, how much work does a baby do? I'll help you all out. The baby doesn't do any work. The baby can't pull itself out because it doesn't know it needs to pull its way out. It can't push its way out. As a matter of fact, the baby's probably fighting to leave the place that it's called home, where it feels comfortable and warm and safe and secure, where all the nutrients and food is at. Like, why are you kicking me out, evicting me out of my, my little home? The mom does all the work. 100% of the work. The only thing the baby does is not resist the inevitable. And so Jesus uses this analogy to say, hey, when you are rebirthed in the spirit, when you are reset in the spirit, you don't have to do any work. As a matter of fact, don't do any work because if you do anything, you're just going to get in the way. The only thing we do is accept what Jesus wants to do in us. Accept what Jesus wants to do through us. Accept what Jesus wants to do around us. And all we are is bystanders observing of God's power in us, through us, and around us. I don't have to do anything. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus did all the hard work on the cross. All I have to do is accept it. Accept it. And so... um, I have to pause here because it's movie month. And, um, and the movie that, that we're kind of using today to bring out a deeper understanding is the movie Interstellar. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's a really interesting movie. It uses a lot of theory or science theory that's out there today. Uh, could be true, could be not true. We don't know. That's not the point. The underlying story there is that planet Earth is coming to an end. It's, it's kind of used all of its resources. There's nothing left to use on planet Earth. And so NASA has been going out of its way to find the possibility of, flying, of finding a planet that human beings can be transported to and start a new life and, and have a reset and, and new resources and new opportunities. And so we, we meet a guy his name is Cooper, and he used to fly. He was a pilot for NASA for some time. And so we, 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 we catch him in this next clip and how uh, a scientist from NASA is kind of convincing him to step into his new role. And I just want you to observe the, and listen to the, to the conversation that they're having and what kind of moves Cooper from not wanting to do it to finally deciding to be a part of it. Let's watch it. Corn will die soon. We'll find a way, Professor, who we always have. Driven by the unshakable faith, the Earth is ours. Well, not just ours, no. But it is our own. Earth's atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. We don't even breathe nitrogen. Blight does, and as it thrives, our air gets less and less oxygen. The last people to starve will be the first to suffocate. And your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on Earth. Murph was feeling a little tired and was wondering if she could take a nap in my office. Yeah. Okay. Now you need to tell me what your plan is to save the world. We're not meant to save the world. We're meant to leave it. Rangers, the last components of our one versatile ship in orbit. 
the Endurance, our final expedition. You sent people out there looking for a new home? The Lazarus missions. Well, that sounds cheerful. Lazarus came back from the dead. Sure, but he had to die in the first place. There's not a planet in our solar system that could sustain life in the near stars over a thousand years away. I mean, that doesn't even qualify as futile. Where'd you send him? Cooper, I can't tell you any more unless you agree to pilot this craft. You're the best pilot we ever had. I barely left the stratosphere. This team never left the simulator. We need a pilot, and this is the mission that you were trained for. Oh, without even knowing it? An hour ago, you didn't even know I was alive. I mean, you, you, you were going anyway. We had no choice. But something sent you here. They chose you. Well, who's they? How long? So he has a, a, a long conversation there trying to get a sense for what's happening. Earlier on the clip, you, you see that his, his attitude begins to change the moment that he realizes his daughter's future is at stake unless something's done. At one point, he doesn't really care if the, if the, er, the world burns, but when he realizes that his daughter won't have a present or future unless something is done, all of a sudden, he gets really close to the scientist and says, hey, what are we doing about it? Now, the mission goes on, and, and it's kind of explained further and what it's going to require from him. And basically, he needs to leave his family belong, behind and everything he knows to try something he's never tried and no one's ever tried before. So the question is, is, is he willing to sacrifice for the sake of his daughter's present and future? Is he willing to give it all up? question that we can ask ourselves today, as Cooper's kind of asking himself the question of what it needs to earth to reset is how, how do we reset our hearts we asked the question earlier in terms of comparing our devices to our hearts but how do you reset your heart today when you feel your heart is heavy or troubled or just needing a reset or rest or just needing hope or love what do you turn to who do you turn to what if God was wanting to reset your heart today just like he was wanting to reset Nicodemus' heart. What if God has been always wanting to reset your heart? We've just been walking in different directions trying to do it on our own. Or, or maybe we've just been carrying so much baggage that we thought it wasn't possible for our heart to be salvaged, rescued, or healed. John chapter 3 verse 13 says, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. You see, Nicodemus was having a hard time with his new concept, didn't get it. And so Jesus is so smart and so loving that he uses something that Nicodemus didn't know. You see, Nicodemus didn't know the Bible, and he didn't know the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, we have this story where God's people disobeyed God, and God allowed this I don't know if this is the right terminology, this pack of snakes, <laughs> large amount of snakes to kind of surround the camp. And these snakes were venomous and, and they ended up biting almost the entire, and the entire population. And so they needed an antidote to the snake's poison. So God has Moses make this bronze snake and just lift it before the people. Crazy thing about this story is that all people had to do to receive healing, to be reset, to have hope and love, was to look at the snake. They didn't have to touch it. They didn't have to recite any phrase. They didn't have to worship it, obviously. They just had to look at it. They had to look at it and believe that the snake or, or that the symbol of the snake could heal them, that, that this, this snake put up on a pole would be the response to their problem. What if our transformation was as simple? Not to look at a snake, but to look at Jesus. The story of Charles Spurgeon, this famous pre preacher, 
is an interesting story, especially we focus on his, his life and his career and his writings and, and how he transformed a nation and brought revival to people that were far from God. But the transformation story of Charles Spurgeon is very, very interesting. He was about 14, 15 years old, and he was trying to seek God, and he had created a list of things he felt he needed to do to be closer to God. And every day he would wake up and look at his list and try to check off all the little boxes so that he could be closer to God. And every day he would wake up, check off some boxes, go throughout the day, check off some more. And when the end of the day came, it was the most frustrating and most daunting thing he would have to do because he would realize that the 50 things on his list, more than half of them weren't checked off. He realized day and day and day after day that he didn't have time. He didn't have enough time, enough energy, enough desire. He wasn't good enough to check off all the boxes. And so one weekend, he was, he was feeling that he needed to be at church, and he woke up uh, uh, bright and early. He got outside, and he realized it was a massive, massive snowstorm, so he couldn't go to his church. So he, re he remembered that there was a closer church to his own, this Methodist church. He wasn't Methodist, but he said, you know what? It's the closest church to me. I'll go there. And so he made it to the Methodist church, walked inside, and soon he learned that there was only like four or five people that had made it to church that weekend, and, and the preacher wasn't going to be able to make it due to the snowstorm. So one of the church members realized that if he didn't get up, then there would be no message that day. And so he got up, opened up his Bible to the book of Isaiah, and he reads this text, random text. He read the text once, he reads it twice, he reads it a third time, and when someone reads a text that many times, either they just want to create repetition or they're trying to figure out what the text means. <laughs> when he finally kind of understood what the text meant, <laughs> he began to explain it. And the meaning of the text was the following, that only when we place our eyes on Jesus, we can experience salvation in our lives. They ended up talking about that for an hour, almost two hours, about what that means to keep our eyes on Jesus, to keep him in the center of our lives. And Charles Spurgeon, as he's listening to this church member explain the gospel, he realized that he had been focusing on the wrong thing. That instead of waking up and looking at his list of 50 things, he needed to keep his eyes on Jesus. And because he started focusing on Jesus, as 14, 15 years old, this teenager begins to fall in love with Jesus, and Jesus begins to change his life from the inside out, and he realizes at age 15 that he needs to become a preacher to share the story of Jesus with the entire world. Because Charles Spurgeon kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to help thousands of people focus their eyes on Jesus. At the beginning, it felt impossible to keep up with the list, but when his eyes were placed on Jesus, everything changed. What if you placed your eyes on Jesus today? What if it was just that simple? What if it was as simple as starting each day with Jesus and just focusing on him and allowing him to lead your day? What if, what if it was just focusing on Jesus when you, were, when you have a need or a crisis or a loss and just focusing on him? What if you focused on Jesus when you see turmoil and division and hatred? What if you just focused on him, allowing you, him to give you the response, the answer, the action needed for that moment? Nicodemus had looked everywhere, but he had not tried Jesus. And so Jesus is inviting him to put his eyes on him. And so in that moment, Nicodemus needs, he feels confronted that he needs to make a decision that he needs to decide which way he's going to turn. And so two things happen in Nicodemus' life that needs to happen in our lives. If we want our heart to reset, it's just two actions. When we are viewing Jesus, we realize that Jesus is also looking at us, and it's like we begin to see ourselves through Jesus' eyes. When I see myself through Jesus' eyes, I see all the wrong things in me. I see all of my sins, all of my mistakes, all of my bad thoughts, my bad words, my actions, and, and I'm confronted. And I just have two decisions to make. I can choose to repent of all the bad things I do and the bad things I am, or I can push it away. I can submit to Jesus and say, yes, that's who I am. I, I need you to forgive me and change me. Or I can say, no, I'm going to keep trying on my own. I believe that Nicodemus began to repent. And not just saying, Jesus, I repent. 
Because that's not just the fullness of repentance. Looking at repentance deeper means that every time I sin, every time I mess up, every time I have a bad thought or a bad word, I, that sin is placing Jesus on the cross again. That one sin is the reason that Jesus had to go to the cross and to suffer for me. That, that one sin is the reason that Jesus had to come down to earth and to live amongst us and suffer for us. But at the same time that one sin Jesus paid the price for, Jesus also had the power to come out victorious from the grave. So when I repent of my sin, I'm acknowledging that I have done something bad and I'm giving, surrendering that to Jesus, but I'm also asking that he give me the resurrection power, the kingdom power to overcome that sin and not repeat it in my life. You see, I'm repenting, turning away from an old life to a new life because I see what it does to Jesus, but I also see what Jesus has done for me. Nicodemus needed to repent from trying to save himself, from trying to prove to others that he was saved and he was good and that he was pure or holy. He needed to repent and let go of pride, to let go of this self-centeredness, this self-sufficiency, and to accept what Jesus was giving him. He also needed to believe. He needed to believe and not just believe in Jesus being the son of God and the savior, but to believe this, that he didn't have to work to be good. He didn't have to work for God to accept him, but that he was invited to rest in Jesus' good works. You see, when we believe we begin to acknowledge that Jesus is enough. That what Jesus does is enough for the world and is enough for me. I don't have to do more than what Jesus asked of me because I can rest in his works. You see, the Sabbath day is a day of Seventh seventh day Adventists. We believe that we can rest and not work on this day because what Jesus does throughout the week, throughout the year, nonstop is enough. I don't have to worry about things on the Sabbath because Jesus is still on the clock and he's worrying for me. Like I don't have to go out of my way to build more things and create more busyness in my life because I trust that he's enough. Today I can repent and accept what Jesus has done for me on the cross and I can rest and believe in him that what he's doing for me right now is enough for me today, tomorrow, and forever. John 3.15 says that everyone, this message is for who? Everyone. Everyone in this room, everyone outside this room. The neighbor, the coworker, the person that cut you off, the person on the other side of political ideologies, the other person that has a different lifestyle, everyone. For everyone who believes may enter where? Eternal life. Eternal life. I heard this story from Timothy, Pastor Timothy Keller, who passed away a couple of months ago. Um, Powerful story about a lady who was trying to figure out life. Beautiful young lady and and fell in love at an early age and and having this new boyfriend and just dreams came out of this relationship of what the present and future could look like. And she thought, you know, if I can, if we can keep this relationship together, you know, if he keeps seeing me as this beautiful woman, I, I have value and purpose and direction. What she didn't know is that later on, this individual would break up the relationship and brought pain. And so she found other men to be in relationships with. And the more she was looking for love and for something to work and validate her value and purpose, the more pain it brought. And so she said, you know what? This is not working out for me right now. You know, I'm going to focus on my ideals and my morals. I'm going to try to live my life independently the best way I can. So she builds up this list of morals to live by and to hold and these principles that were good for her and maybe good for others, but soon she realized that she wasn't even capable of keeping her own morals and standards and and that kind of came to a crashing fall. She then said, okay, I'm gonna focus on work and success and I'll be a successful person and if I'm successful, then other people will see me as this person of value and the more she tried to amass success, the more empty she felt inside and she said, you know what, I can't do that. 
I feel empty. I have more money and I have more resources, but I feel empty. You know what I should do? I should serve others. So she dedicates her life to service and she serves and serves and serves and serves. But the more she serves, she realizes that still that void is not going away. And one day she hears the story of Jesus. A man that, called, that was called the son of God and came down to earth and moved into the neighborhood and became one of us. The Jesus that hung out with all types of people, no matter their walk of life, no matter educated or uneducated, money or no money, you know, decided or undecided, didn't matter for Jesus. He hung out for everyone. And she began to believe that if Jesus could hang out with anyone, he could hang out with her. And she began to see as she focused on Jesus that Jesus didn't view her as she viewed herself or as others viewed her. Jesus didn't evaluate her or put her worth on her past or her present. But Jesus' love for her was unconditional, unchanging. And she fell in love so much with Jesus that she gave her life to Jesus. Her life is transformed. And when she looked back at her life, she said, I don't know how I felt into the trap of thinking that beauty was going to do it or my morals or my success or trying to to help others. She says, I realized I was trying to save myself from myself. Maybe you find yourself in the same situation today where you're trying to save yourself from yourself and you're just feeling a void inside. You're feeling caught in this in-between of of the unknown and uh, the lack of understanding and decision-making. You're you're finding that you're trying harder, but it's not panning out, and you almost feel like quitting because it's not just, it's not working. And maybe God's not working for you, or church is not working for you, or that decision you made long ago is no longer working, and you're trying to find another way. What we can learn from this lady and what we can learn from Nicodemus, what we can learn from Peter and Paul is that the harder we try the harder our lives will be. Maybe it's just as simple as allowing Jesus to do the work. Maybe it's just as simple as repenting and choosing to believe over and over and over again. We're going to skip this uh, next clip I had for you. Um, Things get really complex, but to simplify, Cooper finds a way to communicate with his daughter as he's out, out in space, and he's trying to relay a message to her to save her. He's trying to save her. And he's not just trying to save her, he's trying to save humanity through her. And so when he's having this conversation with one of his colleagues, they ask him, well, how do you know she'll pay attention as you try to reach out to her? And, he's, and, and the answer that he has is enlightening. He says, I know she will pay attention because of love. (laughs) Maybe that's been God's plan with you. He's been loving you and loving you and loving you, surrounding you with love, filling you with love, sending people in your life to love you because that's the only way to save you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. So maybe you're asking, does it work? I think it works. Just by Nicodemus' story. The Bible says that when Jesus died, Nicodemus was one of the first individuals that went to the Jewish leaders and Roman leaders and asked for Jesus' body. Now, this doesn't mean much to us, But if someone who's just been crucified because they thought was a false god and had heresy, you wouldn't be the first one to pick up his body because that would associate you with that person. When when Nicodemus showed up to Jesus the first time, he showed up in nighttime so no one would see him. But the second time he shows up to meet with Jesus, he shows up in broad daylight announcing that he wants to take care of Jesus' body. He doesn't care who hears it, who sees it. He has this boldness about him, but at the same time, this humility that's new, that's brand new, because he began to repent and believe in God. This last clip I want to show with you, oh, before we show it, last clip I want to show with you is that Cooper has been in space and space travel, and while he's been traveling slower in space, Earth kept spinning faster, so his family aged while he didn't age. Don't ask me any more questions. 
But he promised his daughter he would come back. At some point that he would come back and he fought impossible odds to finally make it back to her. And so in this next clip, I just want you to see the conversation they have as he finally makes it back and has a conversation with her. It's interesting, the last part, I hope you caught it, where he said, how'd you know? She says, because I know my my father promised that he would come back. You see, your father has also made you a similar promise, that he would come back for you. He's not going to leave you alone. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to let you go through life alone. That he's always been with you, and he always wants to be with you. And even when we do feel alone and we feel empty and we feel like we're going through kind of the, the, fa- the valley of the shadow of death, we're not alone. He's with us. And the most beautiful promise that Jesus made was that he would return. And he wants to return for everyone who's began that transformation in him, for everyone that's repented and began to believe and allowed the parousia to become real in their lives. So today I want to pray for everyone in their journey of Jesus, for everyone that's that's needing today to hit that reset button, to just re to fall in love all over again with Jesus like that first day you did when you gave your life to him. Maybe you're needing Jesus today to kind of reveal himself to you in a new way, in a big way, in a different way, to remind you of who he is and the promises that he's making into your life. Or or maybe you're just carrying a lot of baggage and you're needing Jesus to lift up that baggage and to carry it for you. He wants to do all the work. All you have to do is let him. Next Saturday, we're having a baptism here. We're celebrating a new life in Jesus. And maybe today's message has brought you to a decision to make a life, a decision for Jesus as well, to give your life to him. To say, Jesus, I don't want to struggle on my own anymore. I don't want to keep trying my own ideas, my own way. I want to, I want to surrender. I just want to let you, you navigate my life and help me make my decisions. I want you to be my friend and my helper. I want you to be my king and your king. I want to be part of your kingdom. And so if that's where Jesus is bringing you today, if that's what he's putting in your heart, please come talk to me after church because I would love to see you be part of that group getting baptized next Saturday. I would love to be part of that journey with you just to celebrate who Jesus is and what he wants to do in your life. And the most beautiful thing we can do to the world is to say, you know, I, I, I want to focus on Jesus. The most beautiful thing we can announce to the world is to say, you know what, I'm done trying on my own. I want Jesus' help. I want him to be the one that leads me. I want to stop resisting, stop fighting, stop struggling. Maybe you've been fighting with God and pushing him away or pushing him down. And today's your day to put those boxing gloves down and to say, Jesus, I I want to be all yours. I surrender. So I want to pray for you today if that's the decision that God has placed in your heart. And if he's placed it in your heart, then don't fight it. Don't resist it. Just give in to it. That's the part of the rebirth is that you don't resist. You just got to let it happen. You got to let it flow. 
And if you do let it flow and you let it happen, your life will be new. It will be better. It will be transformed. You will be part of the kingdom of God. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that as we see our lives and our hearts, as we view a world that's falling apart, literally from the inside out and relationally and in humanity, we see more hatred and more division and more brokenness and more hunger and more addiction and more confusion. Father, we need your spirit and we need your presence to remind us that we're not alone, to remind us that we don't live for ourselves, that we belong to you and we belong to your kingdom. So Father, I'm sensing right now that as a church, we need to hit that reset button to allow you to remove and to add the things that belong to you, to bring clarity to our minds and our hearts and remind us what's most important to allow love to be our motivator and our, and our energy and our, and, our, and, our, and our fuel through life. But most importantly, Father, that you may give us the courage to let go, to stop fighting and stop resisting and stop pushing you back and to just let go and fall into your arms. Help us, Father, to have that boldness to stand up for you and to give ourselves to you, but at the same time, the humility to know that we don't deserve it, that we're not good enough. So as you're speaking to those in the room and online today, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you touch hearts and you bring freedom. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray that you bring healing to hearts that are broken. We pray that you mend broken relationships or those that are just hanging by threads. Father, for those struggling with addiction today, in Jesus' name, we pray that you release the chains holding people down. Father, for those struggling with anxiety or depression, we pray that you bring light in those dark moments and remind them that you're with them even in spite of the storm, in spite of the struggle, in spite of what's hanging over each and every single person. And remind us, Father, that it's not our fight, it's not our struggle, it's not our ability, it's not our strength, but it's all overcome through your spirit. So may your spirit flow through our hearts, our homes, to our church and community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Stand and join us as we sing our closing song. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I owe. When brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance.
Thank you for worshiping with us today here at LifePoint, and may you leave here and continue to live life well. (laughs) 